We're gonna go back to a fantastic era, and that is the disco era. And today on the end of the line, I got Mr. DC LaRue, the king of disco. DC, you there? Hi, this is DC LaRue calling from New York City, and I'm doing an interview with Mark Anthony for Impact Global News. Thank you, and uh, I got a question I gotta ask you. How old were you when you first got into music, and what instrument, if any, and what genre were you mostly attracted to back then? Well, I got into music when I was very young. I started uh, loving, uh, you know, the classics and all the doo stuff from New York City. I lived in Connecticut, and uh, I used to listen to Alan Freed on Tin Tin Wins New York, and then I would listen to Hound Dog Lorenz uh, out, of, out of Buffalo, New York, and uh, I fell in love with uh, the first record I ever bought was a great contender by the Platters, and I was a big doo-wop guy right away. No um, way! Then I, I started recording uh, right out of high school. I started recording at, at 17, and uh, I was signed by a uh, very fabulous producer, Bob Crew, who produced Four Seasons and a, a gazillion other fabulous acts. And I didn't quite, uh, you know, we worked for um, a couple of years, and I never got a hit from Bob, but that didn't stop me. You know, he when he released me, he said, don't give up. He said, you'll find your niche. He said, You're, I, you, it's not working with me, but it's going to work with somebody. So I took his advice, and I kept at it. And uh, several years later, I uh, met Aaron Sheffron, who is uh, one of the, the um, organizers of Ten Wheel Drive with Kenya River Band, the uh, horn band, the rock horn band. And I had a couple of ideas for uh, some disco records. Disco was just coming in. It was 1974, 75. And so I, I approached I, I approached Aram. I was an art director at the time, and I did his album covers uh, for Polydor. And uh, I approached him, and I said, listen to this tune, uh, Aram, what do you think? And it was Cathedrals, and, and he fell in love with it. He said, oh, my God. He said, I do hear it, you know. And he was a heavy-duty rock and roll guy. So then uh, I, we took um, the demo around to every... <laughs> funny every record company in new york city turned it turned it down and uh so i finally ran into this guy dennis ganham who was a promotion man at the time for brute records b-r-u-t and it was uh, a division of fabrice and they were releasing soundtrack albums so dennis signed me to a personal recording contract and then he lost his job at brute so Dennis actually put pyramid records together just to finish cathedrals and and release it so that's the story. I mean, the, the Pyramid Records was a record company that was formed especially for me because they didn't have a record deal. And uh, but Dennis loved it. Out of all the people, I took the the record to. And um, now this is my my mid twenties when I was like 22, 23. And um, so, uh, and it was a media hit. I mean, we were right on the money with the, that particular track and the entire album. So I started early. I started when I was like 16 years old. And I had been recording for a while. And uh, when I first recorded for Bob Crew, I wanted to be like a, a Bobby Rydell or a Frankie Avalon, <laughs> actually. And um, I wanted to be that kind of bandstand white boy singer. But it never worked out. It never happened. So and I, I ended up being a disco guy. Okay. And could you tell us, were you ever in a band or were you always a soloist? I was always a solo. Uh, I was never with a band, except now I'm with a band. Uh, my friend Vladimir Sitkar, who's a, a, a very, very um, talented man, uh, asked me to perform with him every once in a while. I just started performing again with a live band. But I was just a, always a studio act, you know? And uh, I never had my own band, so. Okay, DC, your first disco album was called Cafe Dress. Tell us the story and the reasons behind that title. Well, that was just the style thing. It didn't mean anything. People, um, I designed the album cover, and uh, <laughs> of course, on the back, uh, where the three hottest discos, the photographs of me standing in front of the three hottest discos in New York City, Infinity, Flamingo, and Soul West. And, uh, and uh, the front of the Cosby Draws was just uh, an artistic thing that I did. And uh, it didn't mean anything. It was just for the creative bent, you know? What can I say? Hey, DC. I know you worked with some cool people like Sharon Red, and your song was featured on that blockbuster movie called Thank God It's Friday. How do you feel about dance music today? Does it still have the same energy as the 1970s? Well, you know, uh, it's an interesting question. I think it's like anything else, you know. In the 70s, well, first of all, the 70s, uh, 
uh, gave us so much fabulous dance music that you're almost overwhelmed. And but as much as there were good tracks, there were just as many bad tracks. And um, and like any in musical genre, any any niche, you know, there's the good and the bad. Uh, now I get the um, the biweekly report from the New York Record Store on the dances. I have to say that it's the same as it was back then. There are records now uh, that Rihanna record that she did with uh, uh, that that guy from Scotland, Calvin. Uh, fabulous. I mean, I hear stuff. I I run out and, and, and I. I downloaded it from my YouTube or, or Tracksource or whatever. There's some great stuff out there. And I, and I can't say that I love everything, but it's like it always is. You know, there's great pop music and there's great dance music and there's great... The stuff now, um, I love it. I really do. I, you know, I, I, I don't have a desire to record anymore, but I would feel very comfortable in making a dance record the, the way they sound today, you know, all, uh, you know, with the... Uh, uh, the, all the uh, 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 digital stuff that goes on. I really would. And, and like I said, I don't... Uh, the, only, the only era that I hated, really hated in dance music was the late 70s. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It was the late 80s, early 90s. I hated the, you know, the Tiffany records, I think we're alone now, and the Debbie Gibson stuff. I mean, during that late 80s, early 90s dance stuff, WKTU kind of stuff, I thought it was the worst, and I I don't even know the records. I remember I did one of my Disco Juice shows, and I had the uh, listeners uh, contribute the titles that they wanted, and I didn't know any of them. And, and when I, I did the whole show of the 80s music and late 90s music, and I hated every track, and I still, I mean, I, I removed myself so much from dance music during that period. I mean, I thought it all sucked. I mean, I really did. Now, uh, so I like a lot of the stuff that today, but it's just like anything else. Some of it is great, some of it is garbage. For real, DC, hey, tell me, was there ever a vocalist that you wish you had the opportunity to have worked with back in the 70s? Who would that have been? Tell us, who would that be? You know, I never thought about it. Actually, I did two duets with Lou Christie, but Lou Christie and I have been friends for 40 years. We met backstage at the uh, Brooklyn Fox during a, uh, a Murray Decay rock and roll show. I was there to see Bobby Darren and uh, Diane Warwick. And uh, I met Lou, we became friends right away. He was performing in the show. And uh, when I had uh, cathedrals, uh, he was just coming back to New York City. He had gotten married and was raising a family in Pittsburgh. And I asked him if he'd like to do uh, a duet with me. So we wrote Don't Keep It In The Shadows, and that was on the tea dance. And then we wrote I'll Keep Up Screaming In The Middle, I Wake Up Screaming In The Middle Of The Night, and that was on Confessions, we wrote that together. And then we did a duet on Star Baby, my last album, and she was on. So I never really thought of, of doing duets with anybody. Uh, I never did, I just thought um, I was out to do my own thing. And uh, I never really had a desire to record with anybody else except Lou because we've been friends for so long. Now, I know that this is going to be a bit of a tough question, but still, let us know. Of all the song and albums you have ever recorded or released, which was your personal favorite and why? Okay, well, that's a difficult question. I mean, I was proud of everything I did, and I, there, I wouldn't have had it released uh, and, and to the public uh, if I didn't love every track. Now, if you want to know my favorite album from beginning to end, I think it was uh, The Tea Dance, my second album. Because when we went in to, to do the next album after Cathedrals, you know, everybody was scratching their head and wondering how I would pull it up. So The Tea Dance was a conceptual album, and it was a, when it was finished and pressed, I remember listening to it and saying, this album is the perfect album. It's everything I had desired, every creative thing I wanted in an album. I said the performances, the arrangers, uh, arrangements, and uh, it, I was just delighted with it back in, when it was released. And I feel the same way about it today. I really love it from beginning to end. It was a, it was a tribute to the dance, you know, the dance. Overall, it had sambas, it had foxtrots, it had tap dancing, it had disco. Every track was a tribute to some kind of a dance. The samba, oh, blah, blah. And as far as my favorite song is concerned, this is very strange because over the years, 
they change, you know? I will listen to an album and I was like, oh no, that's my favorite. And then I'll listen to another album and I said, oh no, that's my favorite. It's interesting, I was performing in Brooklyn and I did the, I put the tracks of Hot Drums and Voodoo Rhythm and uh, just, just as a performance, you know, I was singing live to tracks. And I remember after putting that track together for the performance, I said, this has to be the best fucking track I've ever heard in my life. I never realized it was so exciting. So, they, my favorites change over the years, the individual tracks. But I'll tell you, my uh, uh, ballad on um, Portions of the Night called Don't Be Afraid of the Dark always ends up to be my favorite because it has a, um, a wonderful sentiment to it and it has a wonderful positive feeling to it. And uh, that's, that exists today. I mean, I listen to it now and it has a message of living life on life's terms and not being afraid. And so I love that one best of all, that song best of all. But I love everything I've done, you know? And um, I, uh, in my, yeah, over the years, that always ends up to be my favorite track, only because it's such a wonderful song with the outlook of life. You know, I, um, when I did cathedrals, I, I, if you noticed, I never wrote any book, uh, I love you, you love me, you broke my heart, come back to me kind of lyrics, that romantic stuff. I did it when I was a kid, but uh, with the inception of cathedrals, uh, it was an interesting time in, in, um, in the social life in New York City. Do you remember that movie with Diane Keaton, Looking for Mr. Goodbar? It's a long time ago, but it was the Looking for Mr. Goodbar syndrome, and I was right in myself right in the middle of it and it was you know it wasn't just gay it was straight too i mean infinity was a straight club and they would be fucking in the corner you know the boys and the girls would be fucking in the corner after hours it, but there was a there was a new sexual liberation thing happening a, a freedom a free sexual thing and it, it covered all bases people thought it, when cathedrals came out they said it was a gay album but it wasn't gay as such. It, that lyric applies to anybody who was part of that Mr. Goodbar, Lee from Mr. Goodbar syndrome. It was straight people and gay people and bisexual people, and it was all uh, fueled by drugs and cocaine and marijuana and no alcohol. Way. So, and, and I realized at that point in my life when I wrote Cathedrals, that was the honesty, and I was always very honest with my lyrics. It, it, they weren't uh, pie in the sky romanticism, they were real nitty gritty. This is how it is. That's why. That's why I never got on the radio. You know, it was never boy loves girl, girl loves boy. You broke my heart. Please come back again. It was cathedrals where hungry people in the night. I'll go on to somebody else. I'll fuck with somebody else. And all my albums um, uh, had that honesty in their lyric. And I re and when I finished with the fifth one, Star Baby, I, I was so pleased with that lyrically and what what it stood for. And, and, you know, Aaron would say to me, you know, they're never going to play this on the radio. <laughs> and I said, I don't care. I don't care if they play it on the radio. There's a, there's a, a, I have a fan base out there that wants my honesty. So you never look to me and my songs for, uh, you know, if you broke up with your girlfriend from, <laughs> you know, you just, because they were about other things. My lyrics were about other things. And I always go back to Don't Be Afraid of the Dark because, and as much as I always loved um, uh, uh, documenting that sexuality, that that free sexual thing that was happening in the '70s, I love "Don't Be Afraid of the Dark" because it's not a romantic song, but it's a it's a wonderful direction on how to live uh, by being courageous and and self assured and not being afraid to go out into life. You know, so that's it. But my favorite album is still T Dance. You know what I'm saying? Now I know you got a story to tell, DC. Were you ever a regular at Studio 54? Oh, please. That was such fun. <laughs> yes, I was a regular at Studio 54. And I remember um, I had known Steve and Ian from a, a, a disco they tried to open in Queens called the Magic Garden. And I went up there a couple of times. And, and Steve loved cathedrals. They just loved cathedrals. And um, Steve and Ian. And when uh, they opened up, when they were about to open up the studio, I was invited to a couple of uh, pre-opening parties. I remember 
going in that door and walking up that hallway with all that bevel uh, glass mirror, it was like Versailles. You know, they had the whole thing. You know, you walk into Versailles, you have this whole, everything is mirrored with this gorgeous bevel glass and reflecting the chandeliers and the furniture. And um, uh, it was wonderful. I got a, I went, I went up the, the first, that, that rampway with Aram, and I remember looking at Aram, and I said, this disco was such a fucking hit. I said, this is just going to be sensational. And I walked into the room, and I got a, I got a thrill. I just, it, the whole place was so unique and so different, and it was so conducive to partying. And uh, and through the years, I, you know, the people would say, what does it cost to get into Studio 54? I never paid to get in. And I'd go up there, and Steve would give me a bottle of champagne and a, and a, and a thing of cocaine <laughs> you know? and really and I set myself up in the corner and just party all night long and and then um, uh, the music Richie Kazar Richie Kazar was, I had known him from Hollywood and um, uh, and he played uh, at Hollywood and he played at Ray Sartan he had been around a while and Richie was the sweetest guy oh my god you know and great friends and he became the DJ there and then um uh, there, oh, people would say to me, what's going to get into Studio 54? And I said, I wear whatever I've got on and decide to go. I said, I could go in my pajamas and they'd let me in. Because it was the truth. Uh, I had some of the most wonderful times in my life in that club. And I wasn't, re- you know, they played my records, but they opened, Studio 54 opened on my birthday, which was April 26th. And uh, I remember going in, I, I had um, dinner with Tom Severi, who was a DJ at 12 West. He was April 26th, his birthday, and we had a birthday dinner, and then we went to Studio 54 after we had dinner, and I walked in, and, and the DJ put on cathedrals, and it was the best birthday I ever had in my life, because that was Studio's birthday, and it was my birthday as well. I, uh, it, it, it was in and of its time, I mean, by the early 80s, it was like a, it was depressing, you know, because the whole scene had changed, and it was, uh, it, wouldn't, it, it had never happened before, and it would never happen again. You know, that, what that magic that studio had. And nobody could capture it. The only other disco I really loved was The Saint, which was a gay disco in the old Fillmore East uh, Theater. And I have to say that I was always a guest there as well, because I knew the DJs that were playing, like Robbie Leslie and Jim Burgess, but I called them, I'd, they'd leave my name at the door. But that was the best, uh, guessing under that dome was just a thrill beyond belief. And during its heyday, there was nothing else like it for a gay club. And it was a gay studio. Was never a gay club. Studio was everything. <laughs> you know, tri- You know, it was straight. It was gay. It was bisexual. It was drag queens. It was everything. Um, uh, the Saint was a gay club, but it was the best gay gay club club on the on the planet. And what an exciting evening you could have there. I mean, uh, Robbie, I think it was Roy Thode. I was there one night, and he played the 12 inch of Hot Jungle Drums and Voodoo Rhythm. And I, I, went, I was with my friend Bob uh, Lyle, and I said, you know, I've never heard a record before in my life. It's, the, it's like another record. It sounded so fabulous, I got chills. So their sound system was so fa- incredible as well. So that's the two, those are the two discos, but... And I'm so glad I was a part of it. Oh, please. I'm so glad I was I was there for the excitement of that time. You know, I really am. Personally, I remember a dude that I used to uh, write to a long time ago, like a pen friend type of thing. His name was Vince Aletti. Now, Vince Aletti was a famous um, writer for the Rolling Stones magazine, big in the disco era. And I used to write to this guy, and I used to talk to this guy all the time. Little did I know, you know, he was so famous in New York. He used to work in the, uh, the Tower Records in New York. And he used to send me a whole bunch of hip-hop and old funk. And I used to pay for them over the line. Oh, I know him well. He's my friend. I talk to him. I see him. In, he's, on, uh, he's in the West East Village. So, DC, tell the world about, you know, you and your friendship with Vince Selecti. He had his disco file column in Record World magazine. Vince and I have been very, very good friends since 1976. He had a, it was one, you know what, I'll tell you what, I don't think I've ever discussed this with anybody, but Vince and I uh, got friendly, and he was very friendly with Grace Jones. OMG! And then I met Grace, uh, uh, and we had uh, dinner at Vince Letty's one night, the three of us, and if that wasn't the wildest night, and uh, we, as there was a time when we were all getting high, you know, uh, Vince used to smoke a lot of weed, I don't think he does now, and Grace and I were there, and we were drinking, and we were high, and uh, 
I remember the events was great. I even saved a dish. So he had these porcelain dishes, and he gave me, he had made spaghetti and meatballs, very Italian. And he gave me the dish with leftover spaghetti to take home, and I still have the dish from 1975. Oh, man. Yeah, Vince. Vince is a great guy. And you know the interesting thing? He was always true to himself regarding the, the music he, he, he uh, reviewed. <laughs> and um, when Forces of the Night came out, I kept looking at his column and looking at his column, didn't review it. And I called him up and I said, Vince, I said, I gave you an album. We had dinner, I gave you an album. I said, you haven't discussed it. And he said, DC, he said, I don't like the album. It scares me. He said, I don't know where you're coming from. But by the end of side one with the police sirens and the fire, he said, I heard them and I ran to my window and it got me scared. He said, and I didn't like the album at all. Oh, so, man. As opposed to writing something bad about Forces of the Night, Vince, couldn't write about it which was such a he was such a sweet man you know what I'm saying rather than say something bad he didn't say anything at all another tough question DC but what do you prefer do you prefer being a producer a songwriter or a singer tell us all of that I don't prefer any one of them and you know the interesting thing is, is that when I'm finished with an album in the studio and I listen to it completed I'm fulfilled at that point creatively I've never had a burning desire to perform People would say, why don't you go out on the road? And I said, oh, please, I don't want to go out on the road. And I love my farm and I love my home. I've never been... I just did a show with Melbourne Moore and Michelle Fleming from the first choice. <laughs> and uh, on New Year's Eve, I did a from the piano out in Coney Island. And we were discussing this. And uh, Melbourne Moore has such a burning desire to perform. And Michelle Fleming has such a burning desire to perform. And, and uh, they looked at me and I said, well, you know what? I was just happy making their albums. I, I wrote them, I co-produced them, I performed on them, I did the covers. I, the whole package was like my creative orgasm. And I said, once that, that was over, I had no great desire to, to, to perform a lot. I have. I did a lot of gigs in, in, uh, in London and, uh, and Paris and, and Amsterdam and in Germany and Hamburg and, uh, and Munich. And I can remember those things during the 70s. For real? Uh, pretty much all around the world. Uh, but <laughs> it was always under duress. I always couldn't wait to get home. And, and, and uh, I, you know, some people, uh, that's a, just a, a continued extension of their creativity. I'll, I, if you want to book me, I'll book, I'll, you can book me, and I'll have a wonderful time performing, like I did New Year's Eve. Uh, and I'm going to be doing B.B. Um, King's. Uh, in September or October, I'm going to be, uh, which is a great club here in New York City on 42nd Street. So they want, they reached out to me, and I said, for sure, I did the Blue Note, the jazz club here in the Village, West Village. So I'm not saying I dislike it. I'm not saying I just like performing. I love performing in itself, but I never had a mad desire to do anything else. And therefore, I, I cover all the bases. I love writing. I love performing. I love singing. I love producing, I love arranging, I love designing the album covers. I have no favorite. It's a whole creative package. Hey DC, I know y'all been chilling for a while, but tell me, are you still involved in making music today? Are you involved in any projects that we should know about? Nothing, nothing. I um, I did a, 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 a track called Crash and Burn with uh, Levine, Ian Levine over there, who's you know, big producer over there in the UK. And he reached out to me about four years ago, and he said, um, I'm putting uh, a compilation together, and I'm producing all my tracks, but I'd love to have you do a cut with me. <laughs> and I said, oh, my honor. I said, because he had played so many hits on his record shack label. And uh, so he did a track, and he sent me the track, and then I wrote the song over it. And, he, and then I sent it back to him. I love digital recording. And I was really excited about it. You know, and I said, well, I would never have uh, instituted this. I would, it's never been my idea. But if Ian wants to do it, we'll do the best we can. And I loved the track. It was called Crash and Burn. And we had all these remixes done. And we are going to put out a CD5 for all the remixes. And um, it was a wonderful tune. It was a wonderful record. And I thought it should get attention. But you know what? I thought I, I had no great desire to record or write songs anymore. The muse has kind of like flown away. I'm very happy with my, my, my five albums. I just I think I've said all I have to say. Uh, it was hard. It was difficult writing the lyric uh, of Crash and Burn 
for Ian because I had said all I have to say. It was like that was it, you know. And and um, but the record came out and nobody cared, Mark. Nobody cared. Uh, and if they cared, it, but they still loved cathedrals and they still loved looked and dance and they still loved that kind of Friday. But they didn't care. They just didn't care. And I realized a long time ago that the music business is a young business, a youthful business, and. Uh, I just better be satisfied and happy with the fact that I had a bunch of hits in the 70s. I had my five albums. I'm proud of all of them. And I and, and it's difficult for me to write. I can't do it, but it's difficult. I have to work for it. When I was a kid, they just flowed through me, you know? It was just, I would have to walk around with a little tape recorder uh, because I would write an entire song in the street and then I'd forget it by the time I got home. That's how the creative thing used to flow with me. It doesn't do that anymore, and uh, I, I'm not resentful at all, but it's the young people's business. And I'm glad that my fans love me, and I have a whole bunch of new fans from my radio show, Disco Juice, on Newtown Radio, uh, every Saturday night from 6 to 9. I have, I have fans for the radio show who never even knew I made a record, because <laughs> I'm their favorite disco DJ. And um, I'm very happy with it. I'm keeping active, and I have my Facebook page, and I have my radio show, and I have a great, I'll have perform every once in a while when somebody reaches out to have me perform. I have no desire to record again, you know. I, I, as a matter of fact, as, as the older I get, the more desire I have to perform again, if that could, if I could say that. Uh, not a burning desire, but I'm always delighted when somebody calls up and says, can you do a gig, you know. Now, we all know the music industry's changed a whole heap over the past years. It ain't as analog as it used to be. But what advice would you give the musicians today that want to achieve what you achieved back then in your era? What you got to say to them? Okay, well, it's a different music business. And um, totally different. It, and the digital thing and the, and the Facebook thing and the uh, downloading and the, the streaming. <laughs> there are only three or four companies that mean anything. And to make them a, they have to make you a priority, like Universal or, or Sony, and um, it's so hard. And, you, and, you, and unlike myself, where you can have hit records and not perform, today you have to be a concert act in order for any record company to invest any kind of money. It's scary. And I, and I say, I, when I discuss it, I say, you know, it's not that I don't think I would be able to record today if I were like 20 years old. I said, because when you have that burning creative desire, uh, you can't stop yourself. So if I were 20 now, I, it's difficult. It's, it's like 100 times more difficult to get a good record deal today. That being said, I think if I had that 20 years old and I had the desire to record and write and produce, I would do it. And so the advice is never stop believing in yourself and never, it's like, don't be afraid of the dark. Always have the courage of your convictions and keep trying. Now, uh, when I was recording, uh, I started out recording for Bob Crew, and I was getting turned down and turned down and turned down for years. Now, if I had let that uh, discourage me, they would have never been the cathedral. For some reason, I wasn't programmed to be discouraged. And I was always say, well, if they don't like it, uh, if they don't like it, I'll play for somebody else. It's all a matter, of, it's all subjective. It's all a matter of personal taste. But the clue is, you have to believe in yourself and you can't give up. You can't stop trying. Now, that doesn't guarantee that you'll get a hit and that you'll get a record deal, but it does guarantee that you're still in the game and, and there possibly there's one shot that you'll win and you'll be signed and you'll go on. But you'll, that will never happen if you get discouraged and give up. So the only uh, advice I can say, even today, is it's a different record business for the recording industry. Uh, just have faith in yourself and never give up. Because that was my experience. And they say, oh, easy for you to say. And I said, no, no, no. It's not easy for me to say. I got turned down by every record company in town with cathedrals. If I, if I had gone to two record companies and got discouraged, there would never be a record. You know, I just, I, I just like blindly rushed into the record companies and played them the demo. So that, that's it. In a nutshell, my advice is, is believe in yourself and never give up. And uh, that's it. I mean, it doesn't guarantee that you're going to get that hit, but if you stop trying, you'll never get it. Now, DC, I know there would have been some badass studios that you recorded in back in the day, 
but which studios did you record in and which ones did you enjoy working in the most? Well, it was interesting because um, I recorded in a lot of studios. Uh, uh, cathedrals has some groove sound and, uh, and uh, I, I, I sound ideas was the second studio I recorded in. Um, PBS, I recorded in different studios. The, the one I loved best though, uh, it was all recording because Cathedral was recorded in the Groove Sound because we were on a real budget. It was all acoustic. <laughs> it was all analog. And uh, we do lots of overdubbing. And uh, oh, it was a different recording process. And as you well know, it was totally different. And the steps would be, uh, you know, like when I worked with Bob Esty, we would do the rhythm track and then we'd we find the lyrics in the song, and then he bring in the horns, and then he bring in the background. Well, all separate sections. They're all overdubbing. Then he bring in the strings. Uh, my favorite studio, though, and my favorite engineer. He's no longer with us. Bob Stone. Oh man. At Larrabee Sound in Los Angeles in West Hollywood. Uh, I had the best fun. It was the most delightful experience. Uh, we came out with some great records. That was the very beginning of introduced synthesizer work into my recordings, and um, it, I love that man. And he was, and, and and I can say this one thing: he did the remix on "Let Them Dance" and the extended uh, 12-inch remix on "Do You Want the Real Thing" from uh, "Thank God It's Friday." <laughs> I, they were brilliant. He was like uh, uh, divinely inspired. That. 12-inch record of, of Let Them Dance was just, it still gives me chills. And it was all Bob Stone. And it's interesting, uh, Bob just took it upon himself to be the best he could. And I, I, I love him for it. And he's not here anymore. He died uh, about 15, 20 years ago. But I'll, that was my favorite studio. It was awesome. And then we, at, at, we, I recorded up in, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, Star Baby, and then... Uh, and, and, uh, and we did vocals up there, and then we came down here, and we did the, oh my God, the Fourth Midney Studio, the Arrows. We recorded most of uh, Star Baby. I, you know, every album had a different uh, recording studio, and, and the, you know, and my favorite recording studio was Larry P and Bob Stone, the engineer. The engineer is very important because if he's if he's just interested in your work, if you you don't want him to be there to just you know make his X amount of dollars an hour. You want the engineer to be excited. I learned that the hard way. If the engineer doesn't like the music and doesn't like the, the musical genre, you just might as well check out because I had that experience once in my life. And uh, if the engineer isn't contributing on, on a, as a 100% level, uh, then you're fucked. <laughs> you can believe all you want in your arrangements and your songs and your production and your this and your that, your, the, the, you know, your triple scale union musicians and whatever, but if the engineer doesn't like what he's doing, he's, it's very difficult to get a great sound. Now, DC, we know you're still hitting the clubs and going to parties. So if there's any uh, producers out there that you listen to or tend to listen to and you like, which producer would that be? So it's a bad question to ask me because... I don't plan on recording, <laughs> and and even though I like a lot of the stuff that's done today, I don't pay attention to writing it or producing it. Uh, the only one I'm really familiar with is Calvin Harris, and I love his stuff. And of course, I would love to be produced by Calvin Harris, but there's nothing there. I mean, you know, he just, <laughs> I have no desire to just be a vocalist, and I'm not writing songs anymore. So that's a strange question. You know, I haven't paid it, to be honest, I haven't paid attention enough to be able to give you an answer. Yeah, now as a producer, DC, have you got any secret studio techniques that you'd like to share with all those aspiring disco DJs out there that would like to know what you did back then to create that fantastic sound? No, <laughs> I never thought of it like that. I just went in and did my thing. Uh, there were no secrets. Like I said, you work with the best people, the best musicians, the best recording studios, the most enthusiastic uh, uh, engineers, sound engineers. Uh, you work with people you love and that you're not locking horns with all the time. And, uh, and just be true to yourself. Be true to yourself. I think that, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> when Don Summer came out with um, uh, I Still Love, I came out with uh, uh, Let Them Dance. And both records, uh, I really feel, and I'm not being, uh, I, I, in my heart, I feel those two records changed the sound of dance music. 
uh, with the synthesizer thing that we did. We were the first one on Casablanca. It was Donna and me. Giorgio Morota and Bob Esty. Bob Esty produced me, and it was Giorgio. Giorgio is brilliant. Uh, <clears throat> I mean, he's just, I can't say enough good things about him. Okay, DC, how did the industry take to your song lyrics? A new Bogart called me to the office and he said, uh, can you change the lyric? People think you always think you're talking about gay stuff and, and free sex stuff and sucking. And I said, well, the, the story for Let Them Dance is I'm meeting my hooker girlfriend on the corner and and, and the drug addicts and celebrity and whatever. And, and how can I change the lyric that, if that's what it's about? My music would never be played on the radio because everybody's backed off from it. I think uh, Let Them Dance would be as much revered as Donna's I Feel Love if I had one of those silly lyrics. What did she say in I Feel Love? Oh, I feel love, I feel love, I feel love, I feel love. <laughs> Let Them Dance was about, a, a, you know, man, he deals in the black market, you know? He sells cocaine and weed. And different stories. Uh, but I've never regretted it, and, and the, because my feeling is is that uh, there are enough people out there covering the I feel love thing. I love you, I love you, I love that, So I'll write about um, my hooker girlfriend and, and Vinny selling cocaine and, and uh, you, you know what I'm saying? And my friends getting high on weed. So but I've always been honest with myself, and I've never regretted the fact that my music never was, you know, my fan base is very special. We also hear that you've got a hot radio show in New York. Tell the world, DC. You know, I have my old fans, but they did a, a, a thing on, on the Newtown Radio, that, you know, the listener response thing. And I have over a quarter of a million people listening every Saturday to over 250,000 people around the world in every country. Every country. And uh, those people... Uh, are under 35. Half of those people are under 35. So I have a whole new fan base, too. A whole new bunch of young people who, who have done their research and love disco music and revere my music just the same. I think, is that part of the question? I don't know. I was going off there, but I that's a, my fan base is, is, is expanding, is broadening, and I'm just as happy as, uh, the happiest lark because, you know, if you hadn't asked me 15 years ago whether this would be happening in my life, I'd have to say no. But then the internet came along, and all of a sudden there was Facebook, and all of a sudden I had a weekly radio show. Truly changed my life, changed my entire existence, and I'm back on the block, and I'm, uh, and I'm performing again. I got my radio show, and I get all the feedback from all my listeners, and I'm, it's the best. You know what I'm saying? Y'all been listening to the world's famous Mr. D.C. LaRue. Yeah, okay. All up in here with Impact Global News with your most, Mr. Mark Anthony, a.k.a. The Black Prophet. I'd like to thank Mr. D.C. LaRue for talking with us here today. Oh, my God. Oh, this is D.C. LaRue, and I'm chilling with my friend Mark Anthony, The Black Prophet, talking about good old disco music. God bless. To all my listeners and all my fans in England. Peace. Great, great. So I take care. Have a wonderful day. Now that's word.